Welcome to the Smokies and Wine podcast with JB and Jamie with the best guests, wine and chat. You know it makes sense. Sponsored by Clack and View Wealth Management, working with you today to plan for your tomorrow. Dean, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us on episode three of the Smokies and Wine podcast. Welcome, Dean. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Such a pleasure. On the top. I'm noticing a little drink in the corner there. Um, I'm going to guess it's the same as what we have. Yeah. Um, everybody we asked to choose a bottle, you've chosen the old Charles Heidsick um, shampoos there. Just that's why I've got it here. Thank you very much for this, uh, Dean. Yeah. We'll open it up and join you. Obviously, a virtual right joining then. today. Yeah, it's been, it's our house champagne at the restaurant. We also sell it at, 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 at home. Basically, we've teamed up with them for the past two years. Um, Great sustainable company, one of the best well, leaders in the champagne world. They, they kind of minimise what they, how many they sell. So they only sell one or two million bottles a year. Whereas the bigger houses like Moe and stuff, they're you know they're doing fifty million and stuff for us. So it's a little bit more bespoke. Um, been to the uh, Chateau and stuff like that in, part, in France and in, in Champagne region. Okay, great, great company, and uh, we just work along with them perfectly. It's basically it's the champagne that's it's great to match with food. Whereas a lot of other champagnes are like more of a drinking champagne. The might have a party, a cocktail party, whereas the Ch Charles Heidsick's very much um, matched with food. So you'll find that it's probably the most sold champagne in the Michelin star restaurants in the UK, um, stuff like that, because it, it's perfectly matched with food. The, the one you've got there is the Brut. So that's kind of like their flagship. Um, that is the champagne that we serve with our, our sig well, my signature dish, my smoked lobster and mirror and butter. So yeah, that's you know we pair that with our with our. I've got today. I've got the Blanc de Blanc, All right. a little bit more premium one. I came into the office and uh, I, I realized I didn't have the brute, so I just had to, I had to open that one. So <laughs> well, cheers. Anyway, man. cheers. All the best to you, and thanks again for coming on. Lovely. Oh wow, that's nice. Very nice. All I need now is a wee bit of lobster. That would be lovely. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I just have to say it's eleven a.m. So the things that we are doing for you. <laughs> a lot of things we want to cover with you today. Obviously, you've got your finger in a lot of different pies, chef pun. Um, you've got har. You've got the harbour, the, the fish and chips, the loon and gin that should, yeah. that we want to touch on. Um, the collaborations that you're doing. Um, the hard at home stuff, and I know you've got a couple of new things in the pipeline, which we'll, we'll come on to. But before we do any of that, you worked all over the world. And one of the sort of famous chefs you worked with was Rick Stein. That's correct. Yeah, I trained with Rick Stein. Yeah. What was that like? Uh, set me up for a great career. It was amazing. Working for such a renowned name at a young age was a game changer for my career, I feel. Um, going down there, I remember, I still remember the day, I was actually went down to Cornwall for, um, I was going to go move to, to Newquay for the summer, like a summer away. And I went for a couple of job interviews. Jamie uh, Oliver was one of them. There was uh, another place, another big hotel. And I'd gone to all these interviews and I was actually driving home from an interview and I got a phone call because I'd put my CV everywhere. There's a French guy called Stefan saying, uh, um, hey Dean, uh, you want to come in for an interview? I'm like, sorry, where are you calling from? He says, uh, Rick Steins. I'm like, w when? He said, can you come today? I'm like, I'll be there in like half an hour. I'm coming. You know, so I went, went to Rick Steins and met this head chef, Stefan Delorme. He's still, um, I think he's executive chef now there. I met him, you know, such a warm welcome with this guy. You know, none of this like straight handshaking. It was more like a, a clap hands. How are yeah. you? Sit down. You know, I've just turned 18. Do you want to have a beer? <laughs> sit and have a beer yeah. in an interview. I'm like, wow, this is incredible. So having a beer with this uh, chef, French chef. So when can you start? I said, when do you want me? You know, two weeks later, there I am. That was it. Just when do you start straight away? Just, just like that, as quick as that. So moved my life down there. Um, and worked for Rick Steins for two years. You know, Rick wasn't there all the time. Obviously, he's filming, he's doing books. He's got he's got an empire, you know. So yeah. he was there, he was in sometimes. He's always the man, you know, standing at the pass, glass of wine, watching over the kitchen. But I came became really good friends with his son Jack Jack Stein. We still communicate. We were on the phone the other day because he was in. He well, he needed loads of lobsters, and we needed loads of lobsters. So we're kind of 
helping each other out and just a lot of things about even down to now um, production, you know, we, what kind of issues we've ran because Rick Stein's now doing the same at home box as we're doing. It's very similar with the lobsters and everything like that. So, so it's been good that we're communicating and it's, it's nice to see that a company that we've launched is, I feel it's on par with the Rick Stein at home as well. So to be in that sort of same category is, is you know, it's really good because that's where I came from. So I really like you imagine yourself against the best, haven't you? Which yeah, is- exactly. So working working for Rick Stein's at the seafood restaurant was, you know, it kind of drilled into me quality produce. Produce speaks for itself. Yeah. You don't need to fanny around with it. You do, it doesn't need to be 10 elements. It doesn't need to be cooked for 10 days and pressed for three and hidden with different flavours. Like, if, it, if a great bit of fish is a great bit of fish, you know what I mean? Pop it in the oven with a bit of flavoured oil or pan fry it or, you know, whatever, steam it. Yeah, you know, so you let the produce talk for stuff. And that's kind of the ethos of all of, all of my companies. And I, even down to the gin, no nonsense, just taste. That's our tagline. So for everything we do, it's all about that. It's all about produce. And I kind of took that from Rick Stein. The kind of then travelling part, I've done, I didn't really, was, wasn't trying to copy Rick Stein, it was just a natural thing that happened. But then I went traveling, I went to over 40 countries, was picking up all these cool ideas and flavors and stuff like that. And then that's what I brought back to my restaurant. So it's kind of like what Rick Stein has done. He's gone out in the world and got all these lovely flavors and recipes and brought it back to his restaurant. So naturally, I've kind of done that myself with Har, I feel. But obviously with different style, I'm, I'm yeah. more, Rick's for still very much like, fine dining brasserie um whereas i still want to push the boundary of kind of um relaxed fine dining you know yeah. i want to go for higher awards you know michelin and stuff like that so trying to go those things at the end of the day i'm still 32 i'm still young ish you know I, I want to push i want to be the best i want to be in the well-known name in the country i want to be a great employer you know, I want to do great stuff for my staff. It's great to be able to teach people stuff and teach them that there's a lot of stuff. Scotland's Scotland's quite bad, in my opinion, for food. There's some great restaurants, but to ha- you know, ten restaurants, ha- a couple of handfuls. You know, a lot of a lot of stuff we do is rubbish. You know, a lot of it is just so backwards. You know, we're importing loads of meat and shellfish and stuff like this when it's on our doorstep. Got great stuff here, don't we? Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's a little bit annoying. So it's just it's it's teaching chefs that simplicity is the key, really, and that relationships with your suppliers is the utmost. That's how you do well in business, and especially in the hospitality world. Do you think food's got a little bit pretentious then? That people are really sort of don't want to coin the phrase over egg in the pudding, but there are almost too many elements. Yeah, definitely. I think it's gone through phases. Now we're going back into this kind of Nordic style of cooking. Food is fashion at the end of the day. You know, it changes all the time. I would have said 10 years ago, yes, overcomplicated. Now it's kind of been minimalized again to this kind of Nordic kind of Asian inspiration. You see a lot of Japanese techniques being used in the way Japanese courses are broken down into smaller elements. And that's kind of what the fashion is in food. So, Yes, it was overcomplicated before, and I think a lot of restaurants in Scotland are still in that 10 years ago kind of stage. Not saying that they're terrible restaurants, but they're they're not caught up with, you know, London. London's the, you know, for Britain, London is the, the fashion capital, food fashion capital as well. So the things that are happening there, if you can be quick to react in Scotland, you can be part of that. You know, we've we've had great conversations in the past couple of months with high-end chefs in, in London, you know, some of the best chefs in the country, and they've been talking about, oh, we've heard about you. We know about her. He says, not often these things happen. You know, we don't really hear about restaurants in Scotland. You're making waves in London, but you're in a small town in Scotland. I think that's just because we're diverse. We're on the ball. We let, make things happen. We have an idea. We go with it the next day. We don't just let it go over a month or two. We just say, right, what's the idea? Let's do it. And I think yeah. being on top of that is... It's about being part, the internet is a great thing. It's a, it's a tool that chefs now use, you know, yeah. Instagram, Twitter. Um, these are great platforms for us to all to share recipes, images, ideas, um, what is in fashion, you know, new products. I've, I've made many new supplier friends through Instagram. Our caviar supplier, Exmo Caviar, that's because I've seen it posted by friends in London. Adam Handling was posting it. And I thought... 
who's this company? And I find out it's a it's a British company making caviar. So of course we get in contact. Now, you know, we're getting our lovely logo printed on their caviar tins because we buy so much of it now. So like all these little suppliers and stuff, Truffle as well, got gained them through social media platforms, which was, you know, it's, a, it's definitely a new thing. That wasn't happening 10 years ago. You know, you'd have your suppliers or maybe a chef, another chef friend would let you know a supplier. Maybe they would get, you know, drop you a card or something. But social media is so fast paced now. It can be, everything can be done very quickly. Yeah, do you purposely try and source in Britain then, or is that, you know, do you... Yeah, we, to... yeah everything we do, all premium products as well. Truffles, we can get British truffles, caviar, British, you know, obviously our lobster, Scottish, crab, Scottish, all, all of our shellfish, fish as well. I will only take North Sea fish. You know, there's a lot of this thing where look, even London restaurants, and you'll see it on big chef platforms and stuff where they're advertising scree cod, Nor- uh, Norwegian cod, or uh, New Zealand lamb. And I'm like, why? Why are we promoting this? <laughs> why is any chef in the country promoting another country's produce? Let's promote our own produce. We've got the best white fish in Europe being landed in Peterhead. So why are we not why are we not advertising that? Why are we not pushing those things? Um, North Sea cod, Scottish cod, is exact same cod as this Nordic scree cod, but just because it's got a branding scree, people are going towards that. But just uh, for me, I, we need to promote within. Quick question: Where do you get your smoked haddock? Uh, would depend. Ian Spinks, my uh, smoker hey. supplier. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't say I go there, I was going to go crazy. Yeah, exactly. No, Ian Spink's great man. It was we've you know, I knew him from when I was younger, and then um, I watched like I follow this um, Vice. I don't know if you know Vice um, website magazine, and they do all yeah. these cool videos, documentaries, and stuff. And um, there's this girl that going around Scotland doing a food kind of tour documentary, and she goes and sees Ian Spink, and I watched it. And I thought I need to meet. I need to meet him. He was. I think he was in Cooper. Um, and he was making smokies in Cooper. And I remember walking up to him. My first comment was, these aren't, uh, these aren't smokies. Are they? What do you mean? Like, well, they're not being made in our broth, so you can't call them a smokie. <laughs> you know, you got me there. But, you know, so me and Ian then grew, was growing a relationship. Last summer, he helped me get uh, lobsters as well. So it's about having these contacts in the industry as well. They're not always focused on the produce they make as well. They, You know, they've been in the game 40, 50 years, some of them. So they've got a lot of pals that can help you get stuff when you need it. And lobsters are, you know, the past two months, it's been lobster gate every week. <laughs> you know, the week, you know, most weeks will be rolling in and I'm two, 300 lobsters short. But for some reason on Wednesday or Tuesday, I'll, I'll find them from somewhere. Uh, you know, we we'll drive to the end of Scotland, really? up and down the coasts, finding lobsters. And we've done it every week. We've managed to do it, but it's... Uh, it's coming around now. It's coming to spring. Lobsters are coming in abundance again, so a little bit uh, more relaxed now than it was a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> a bit stressed. Yeah. How much of a boost to your your career would you say the Master Chef program gave you? I definitely have a stepping stone, hundred percent, and that's the way I looked at it from the day I went on it. That was my plan. Plan was to go on it, show the nation my ability. You know, obviously you want you want to go and you set in your head, I want to win it. You don't I wasn't I was so focused on that. I was telling myself every day I'm going there to win. There's no coming second, there's no coming third. Win, win, win. And I think that, that drive got me to the, the final. Yeah, I didn't win. A bit disappointing, but I think I've still a massively a winner from it. You know, if I look at the other finalists and see what I've done since then, compare myself, you know, I'm probably one of the leaders in all of the, all of the finalists and what, what I've created, the businesses, the small empire that we're growing now. So I think it was always, what do you do with it as soon as you're off? You know, you have to be proactive. You have to be phone calls every day, emailing, pestering people, pestering people, restaurants, funding, everything. Try to get people on board. And, you know, a couple of months after being on the show, we had opened her. As soon as we opened her, as soon as I had my own funding, what would we do next? Loon and gin. Two months later, let's, let's, let's launch, a, launch a gin, you know. And then straight after that, right, well, what's the next project, you know? So it's always just driving, driving, driving. I think the key to that as well is having great staff. It's having people that believe in you and believe in what we're trying to achieve and you get them on board and 
you want to hold on to them as long as possible as well. So it's look, looking after your staff in the right way as well. You know, without them, we wouldn't be able to achieve what we've achieved so far. I think, you know, we, we're still a young company. Har restaurant has only been trading two years. It's come up for two years in two weeks. It's the 3rd of April to the second birth, birthday. But within that, as you know, we've Har, Lunen Gin, Harbour, Har at Home, um, Wagyu, uh, so that's Wagyu Burgers. We're launching our Shaken Cocktails this week. Um, we've got Mond Vodka being launched. Um, and we're looking at a new site in Edinburgh for a pop-up for summer, potentially for forever. Um, another home in St Andrews. And also a third site for we're going to put a Wagyu Burger in. You know, growing, pushing, pushing, pushing. I think, I think you know, it's about never sitting back. And, you know, I'd love to have a couple of days off a week, but, you know, as a business owner, that doesn't happen. You're working seven days a week. Your phone's always on. You can't just turn your phone off and be off for two days. That's that's not the way it is, you know. So it's just driving, driving, driving. And it's always looking for the next thing. Or even if I, I, I'm not this sort of person, if I have a couple hours spare, and I'm not doing anything. I feel like why? Why did I not do anything in those couple of hours? I should be online searching for something, trying to see what I can do, how I can, we can invest the money. What What's the next step? You know? Yeah, it's all your passion. You don't mind it so much if it's your passion and you enjoy it. Yeah. It's, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That, that's a lot of um, ambitious plans you've got there. Okay. Spinning as many plates as you intend to spin, you can't be everywhere. Are you not worried you drop one? No, definitely not. No. No, no, no. I think it's about structuring it correctly. Um, I would never push myself to something I don't think I can do, especially when it's money-based. You don't want to waste money either. And if you're investing, you want to make sure you're investing in the right thing. And at the end of the day, yes, you can invest your money into shares, into property. But before you ever do that, you need to invest in yourself. Yeah. You know, Self-investment's number one before you invest in anything else. So right now, that's what I'm doing, self-investing rather than investing in other things. You're, you're more in control of that. You're not in control of the stock market or the property market. So, you know. Yeah. With with MasterChef then, just before we come on to some of the, the, the bits that you did in MasterChef, just what's the process of actually applying to get on the show? Is there a, a testing process beforehand or is it just a potluck or what happens? Um, I th- There's a few stages. First stage is you fill out a form online. They post it everywhere. Um, and then after that, you get a phone call. They kind of do a phone call interview. There's about 20 questions. And then after that, you go to another stage. So before you get taken in for uh, like an actual person-to-person interview, uh, we did that in a hotel in Edinburgh. But before that stage, you get um, checked for criminal records and all that sort of stuff. They have to, because it's BBC as well, you know, they couldn't put anyone on TV that's obviously got criminal records. So- You're from our growth, you managed to hide that, yeah? You managed to hide that. Yeah, exactly, them. yeah, you're being our bro, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, so you have, once you've done all that, we had a one-on-one interview in um, Edinburgh. I still remember I went to Bruhemia. It was a hotel just next to Bruhemia. And I, I think my interview was at one o'clock in the afternoon. So I went to Bruhemia, necked back a couple of double vodkas, <laughs> just, <laughs> just so I could, because otherwise, you know, I might, I thought, I don't know how I'm going to react, because it's, in the interview, it's recorded. It's on camera. There's a camera crew there. Right, okay. So I thought, you know, just a bit of Dutch courage, you know. And, yeah, just talked absolute rubbish <laughs> for, <laughs> for about half an hour. Um, and then after that, got a call. I remember being in Brazil. I'd just gone over with my fiance to Brazil to meet her family. And I was I'd start, on Rio de Janeiro, on the beach, phone call, this my chef. Uh, we just want to let you know that you've got through. You're on the show. Uh, can you come start filming on the 17th of May? I'm like, yep, let's do it. <laughs> so, you know, absolutely brilliant. So of, then, you know, from then you're, you're filming really. So first day of filming, they make it as real as possible as well. There's no um, pre-organised wording or anything like that. Or You'll be cooking this or you'll be cooking that. Yeah, you're not told anything. And basically, we were sitting in this green room with all the other um, contenders. And basically, we were told, right, now you're going through for your skills test. It's your turn. So you go for the skills test. You walk into this kitchen. That's the first time you see Monica and Marcus and Greg. And in the lights, and you remember you're in a studio. You don't think about this, but it's so hot. It's unbelievably hot. Lights pumping down. On your little desk, there's an oven that's on. The, the air's just blowing up, but they have no extraction because of the sound. 
So there's no extraction. And this is in May. So it was nice. It was a hot and hot. And I remember just walking that room and it was like a wall of heat hitting me. I was like, Phew. you know, but you, you just walked up and just chatted with them. You know, being in my like kind of line of work with Private Chef and there's been many a time where I'm standing in front of very, you know, important people in the world or wealthy people or royalty. And you just, you have to be just a normal, everyone's normal. Everyone's a person at the end of the day. So just chatting away is normal to them. But it came across that you were so cool when you walked out. You looked, and I just thought because you were a private chef, that you just looked in your element. It was like you weren't phased at all. Yeah, exactly. I remember just looking down and seeing this bro head of broccoli. And I was like, right, okay. Like, right, right, we need you to make a dish with three course, uh, three elements. I'm like, yeah, no worries. I started cooking the right. So you've you you know what you're doing already. I said, yeah, yeah, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember we were given 15 minutes, and um, I think I did it in 10 and a half minutes. And I was like, I was almost done. I'm like, is it okay if I if I plate? They're like, yeah, of course, plate, plate. I'm like, well, it's not been 15 minutes. They're like, no, no, just get it done, you know. <laughs> and uh, I was a little bit scared because I remember on on uh, I was too busy talking. I was too just chatting absolute rubbish. <laughs> And I was toasting pine nuts in a pan and I burnt them. And um, they were burnt on one side and I hid them. And uh, and Monica pulled me up about it. Um, she said, you know, they loved it. Everyone on the show, everyone loved the dish. It was like 10 out of 10. But in the filming part, I was actually slated by Monica for burning these pine nuts. So when the show went live, I was like waiting to get absolute slated uh, in front of the nation by Monica, but they'd they didn't put that part in. <laughs> So, how long is it actually filmed over? Because when you're watching it, you know, it's it's on for like 24, 25 episodes, which obviously takes a long time. Yeah, What's three, condensed into it when you're on the show? Three months. I think it was three months of filming. Yeah, and it was kind of like every weekend or every second weekend or sometimes during the week. Because we did a few trips. We went to Poets. We actually went to Cornwall, went to Padstow again. I remember driving down because they don't tell you where, which restaurant you're going to. And we're like, we get given our hotel and flights. I'm like, we're in, pa we must be going to Rick Steins. This is incredible. I'm going back to Rick Steins. You know, well, we went to Paul Ainsworth, which was, you know, he, Paul Ainsworth is such a gentleman. He's an amazing chef as well. So it was great to get to work with him. I knew him from when I worked there as well. So it was good to get to see inside his kitchen because a lot of my, a lot of my pals actually worked for him. So, it was kind of cool to go back there, kind of be back in Miami, like walk around town. Like, I know this place. I used to live here for two years, you know. So, and everyone else kind of like, you know, a duck or water, not know what they're, uh, sorry, fish or water, not knowing what they're doing. So, it was kind of good to be there and know what I was doing, know the kind of place, felt confident. So, stuff like that. Great. And then the other place we went to was uh, Anne Sophie Pitt. Incredible restaurant. Honestly, it was just like something out of this world. You go in this place and it's, everything's white like completely perfectly clean kitchen not like a normal not how you imagine a, a restaurant kitchen this is like i don't know almost like for set for tv shows just everything white open mirrors on the roof so it looks look surgical it was amazing yeah and then this 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 this, this angel of a woman you know just comes out and she, the way she talks to you and you just you it's like everything she was saying you just soaking it up it was like she was just teaching you and her kind of ethos of cooking as well was just amazing and obviously her background and her family all had three Michelin, like her father her grandfather all had three Michelin stars and you see all the photos around the restaurant where she's just a little girl running around the kitchen and you're like wow you've literally this is you this is your home really isn't it so it was great to you know learn from her as well and be part of that and I remember the first day we got to cook a dish that was sprung on us we weren't told we were told that we were going to be cooking her food and doing a service. And then it was like halfway through the first day and they're like, right, half an hour, you are all going in and you've got to cook a dish. <laughs> we're like, what? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, we've put some food out, you're cooking a dish. So they do that. They spring things on you. They don't tell you the whole everything that's happening. And I remember cooking this dish, sitting down and just being in that place and being in that kitchen, even your style changed. Like you were more... Like, I remember looking at my food, it was so minimal, looked beautiful on these beautiful plates. And you just, like, you just became more delicate with your food because you were in that setting. Yeah. Rather than this kind of, you know, you put yourself in what you imagine a restaurant kitchen, this kind of harsh industrial environment, you know, but you go into this little, 
like heavenly place. Just your own attitude changed as well. Your own, my own personality changed for for that day. It was it was awesome. Yeah. One of the dishes that she did um, in her in her master class, I think it was, was a, a lobster dish. Yeah. Was that the inspiration for your your lobster with the the mirin butter or? Um, slightly. So the the, the ins, inspiration. I talk about that dish. So her dish was um, lobster with. Um, Berries, red berries. So there was a strawberry on there. There was well, there was cherry on there as well, and raspberry. And it was done with a raspberry and strawberry dashi. So bringing this dashi, this Japanese element, into a dish with berries, just I was so confused by it in my head. <laughs> Trying to work out how is it going to work. But what she does is you think key element like flavors coming from the berries. So raspberry sour. So you're using the raspberry to balance your acidity in the dish. And then strawberry is sweet. So you're using the sugar from the strawberry to balance the sweetness in the dish. So you take your, your, your idea off of the product itself, but the flavor that's in it. And that's what she does with this dish. So it sounds weird to eat berries with lobster, but it works because yeah. of those points in it. My signature dish, that's um, it's from Andrew Fairley. You know, Scotland's best chef. I think you always be Scotland's best chef. Great man, great what he's done for the industry. And, you know, he's got his smoked lobster with his lime butter sauce. I did a stage at Andrew Fairley's and I wanted to learn how they smoke the lobster. They do it different to I do it. They prep the lobster, take the meat out, smoke the shells, put the meat back in, steam it as they heat it up, and then they put their lime butter sauce on it. But the way I do it is we, we smoke, we steam the lobster first, we smoke the lobster whole. So it's just the outer shell. So it's more about the... You only smoke it like two, three minutes. That's all. It's more about the aroma on the plate rather than the taste. And then the mirror and butter is, yeah, I would say slightly inspiration from our Anne. So pick, bring, bringing that Japanese element into, into that kind of French cuisine. Beurre Blanc is a classic French butter sauce. But rather than do it with white wine and white wine vinegar, you do it with mirin and rice wine vinegar. So just using a Japanese ingredient rather than kind of a classic French ingredient, but the same base of sauce. So that's that's where the kind of smoked lobster and mirror and butter comes from. It's kind of a crossover of a couple of people. Um, but the greatest greatest point with that, my signature dish was on the uh, anniversary of Andrew Fairley's death. His family came to my restaurant, his wife and his kids and his, uh, his wife's parents they came to my restaurant to to come and have the smoked lobster dish, which I thought was, you know, it was amazing for me. It was very touching as well. I know that his um, parents-in-law had been in a couple of weeks before and I found out who they were. So I sent them the lobster dish complimentary. Nice. And they, they obviously had gone back and told Andrew's wife. And then she came for the anniversary of Andrew's death for uh, to I don't, celebrate, you know, and, and come enjoy his dish. So that was amazing for me. That was like a, such a, a great moment, and that kind of drove into me that this is my signature dish because a lot of times signature dishes change. You know, you've got seasonality as well, and sometimes chefs get bored of certain dishes, but I think this is one that's going to stick for me. And, you know, what, what, what we've created a whole business around it. Har at Home has been built around that lobster dish. So for me, it's, it's definitely the signature now, you know? I'll have to do full disclosure here as well because JB's a qualified chef as well. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he's in his element here. That was his first job, so he's just he's he's just sucking this up. <laughs> I, I've 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 been to your place, and for anyone that hasn't been, go once things open up again, um, wherever it's going to be. Uh, but the lobster dish was fantastic. But I actually loved the beef the beef tartare was probably my favourite. Yeah, best I've tasted anywhere. Yeah, so again, that's that's definitely like another fusion dish, French classic beef tartare, but with Japanese elements. And there's Italian in there as well. We've got we use gochujang rather than the Tabasco. Gochujang's fermented chili from uh, Korea, and then you've got truffle in there as well. It's obviously kind of cla- Italian side to it. We use British truffle, but you know, it's kind of classic Italian confit egg again, French style cooking, but with the kind of Asian influence. And it's, that's basically what Har is, really, at the end of the day. It's those different elements from different places all brought into one dish, but taking usually playing on a classic. So 
you if you had that beef dish, then the course bef- after that was the uh, the Thai green curry crumb uh, cod, which is also beautiful. Yeah, so that's obviously a take on a Thai green curry, but done broken down, a bit more playful. You know, your coconut broth on there, your little tail, you're made of carrots, and then the Thai green curry crumb. So each dish I usually do is kind of a take on a classic, but done in a kind of fusion style. The wee twist, yeah. Yeah. We were talking earlier, we, we want to call you the Banksy of cooking. <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take that. <laughs> just, just going back to MasterChef, once you get to those latter stages, I don't know how, the, how nervous you are, because... To, to us, when we were talking about it, it almost seemed like you came in at a slightly higher level than, than the others. And MasterChef, I think, is a big thing about they love people going on a journey. You know, yeah. this guy's improved and improved and improved. And they went from, you know, a level three to a level 10. You were probably in at a level eight or nine anyway. And yeah. it didn't have as much of a journey, I don't think. Yeah, definitely. I feel that as well, looking back at it. I think, you know, Lawrence, the winner... Lawrence is a great friend of mine. I think he's done amazing. He's honestly a, a, an amazing chef. Um, his food, his food's inspired me. You know, I've done recreated some of his dishes. You know, his background's from Michelin as well, and great chef. So, but I definitely feel that Lawrence had a, a a more of a journey on the show. You could see that in the earlier stages, some of his dishes weren't that great, and he was getting, you know, he was getting bad comments on them. And then it was kind of like this build up to. Yeah. What, the, what the show has created. So, yeah, I definitely feel that, you know, I came on quite strong and I kind of tried to keep that. I had one bad one bad uh, dish. It was on the chef's table when we did, it was like 30 Michelin star chefs. I did um, the halibut ceviche. And the comments were, they, were, they just felt it was slightly overcomplicated. I'd put two elements on the plate, but they felt it was two dishes put on one plate. But... Yeah, I definitely think there was more of a journey for different different people. At the end of the day, this is a TV show. You know, that you have to remember that. It's not just a cooking competition. It is, for, first most, a TV show. Yeah, it's to be entertaining. So, yeah, so these journeys are definitely part of it. The only, I remember the only time I was ever nervous on the show was was in front of any of these, like, big judges or uh, Michelin star chefs or anything like that. It was the final. Went to the kitchen... And we were all stood at our, our desks, um, little cooking section, and it was the first time it kind of hit me, and I got a little bit, you know, that butterfly anxiety just for a moment, you know, like, oh, I'm actually stood in the final right now. This is the final. This is it. This is it. I need to be on, <laughs> you know, on the ball now. This is we're not just cooking. Or this today is we're going to find out who wins, you know. So that was the only time I kind of felt nerves during the show. So when you walked into that room, the the when you were talking about you know, the the chefs thing there, there's 25 Michelin stars I think were in the room. Yeah. You, you're not got a little bit of butterflies walking in in front of all your. They're not even peers really at this stage because they're your the people yeah. you want to come. I don't know. I'm quite good in front of characters like that. I don't feel too nervous in front of people. Again, this is your private chef thing, mate. It just helped you there. Yeah, and I think you know I, I can talk in front of a room comfortably. I don't mind, and but. Yeah, not nervous. I definitely back of my head thinking, you know, these are all incredible chefs and they're going to be grilling me. Like, because as chefs do, you know, yeah. you're going to, when you eat a dish, you're like, well, I could do better than this. Or, oh, yeah. this is a great thing. I've never seen that before. So, and we all do it. It doesn't matter where you go, you know. So if you, you know, you'll still, you'll still learn from chefs that are way below you in the sense, you know, you might go to a little cafe somewhere and they're just all they're doing all day is sipping sandwiches. But you might go there and see something that they're doing. You're like, wow, I'm, I'll take that, you know. Well, you need to try JB's bread pudding. <laughs> it's it's life changing. <laughs> <laughs> How many times do you practice those dishes prior to to being on the show? Come none. on, don't say you. Do. I'm not buying that. Swear on my son's life, none. Honestly, you just you just crack out first time. Everyone else was testing dishes. I was too busy. I was too busy. I was filming private private chefing. So I'd stop, I'd finish filming. I'd be somewhere else in the world. And I'd come back and I'd be then I'd be away again. And so what I was doing was flying in or out. I'd be writing down menus. I actually still do it now. I still some days I'll write something down and the next day it's on the menu. We've not even tried and tested it yet. <laughs> you know, and it and then it evolves. 
So yeah. I put it on the menu and then we start the evolution side of it, which I know it's not the correct thing to do, especially for Michelin. You need to be tried and tested every dish, but that's not who I am. I'm not a person who is massively super organized. Like I'm not someone to have every recipe written down to the gram. You know, it's all up here for me. I'm very hands-on. And that's the sort of kid I was at, at school as well. You know, I was never the, the kid that was very good sitting in English or geography or maths. I was good at HE and art and sports. You know, I had to be hands-on. So that's the sort of person I am. So didn't really try and test the dishes. There's definitely some of the dishes, obviously, cooked these elements before. Yeah, yeah. You know, I know, you know, one of the dishes I was very lucky with with blew them out of the water was the octopus dish. Marcus said it was the best octopus dish he yes. ever had. I remember that, yeah. And uh, it was on the tube into the show, and I was just sitting there. I knew what the day was. We were going to do a, 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 basically a test. I knew there was going to be a load of food. So I'm already creating a dish in my head before we arrived to the studio. And I was thinking, I want to do an octopus dish. I know an octopus dish, what I'm going to do, I'm going to do it with burnt tomato. I'll do it with a citrus quinoa. I'll do it with some like nice herbs and, and oils and stuff like that. And lo and behold, we walk into the room and there's octopus on the table. Yes. <laughs> you didn't know there was octopus there. And everybody else was too scared to touch it. You know, if you get octopus wrong, it's yeah. terrible. Oh, you know, it's like rubber. But I know what I was doing. So I saw it and I'm like, I already know the dish I'm doing. So it's already a dish I'd done before, you know. Obviously, there's some elements changed on it because there was no quinoa. Yeah. Oh, no, sorry, I was going to do barley, but there was quinoa instead. So I used the quinoa rather than barley. So stuff like that. You know, there was sprouting broccoli instead of um, uh, asparagus. So, you know, these little bits and bobs. So if you're if you're on the ball enough, it's not too, you're never too much in the kind of moment left in the crap, really. You you pre prearrange in your head, you know, right, what are they going to spring on us today? Right. Well, I'll try and plan something prior to that in my head. So when it sprung on us, I'm like, I'm already prepared. One of the ones I've got to ask you about, I think it was the semis, uh, and I love the fact that you did it because it was uh, out of respect for your nana, the Bonoffi pie. Yeah. Uh, and that was the one where you were trying to whack this bomb <laughs> with a with a spoon. <laughs> I bet you wish you'd practice that now. Yeah, definitely. Because uh, would it take two or three times before you could actually crack it open? Yeah, so the story of that is I use like these chocolate spheres you buy and they've got a little hollow top and you fill them up and you seal them and you can do whatever you want. It's, most chefs use these the kind of pre-made, it's just a chocolate shell really. Yeah. And I was told I wasn't allowed to use the chocolate shells last minute. I had to make them myself. So, and the way it was actually happened was I was, I think there was 10, 10 people in that, or maybe eight in, in that episode. And my dish was, Test tried from the judges last. So we're talking three hours from when it was ready. So that had to sit in the freezer as well. So when it came out onto the table, it was actually frozen. If you actually look at it, the caramel on the plate is solid as well. So the whole thing was frozen solid, oh. which obviously didn't help either. <laughs> I remember trying it. I had to spoon nothing. I had to spoon it. And the Marcus just burst laughing. He was like, gave me a knife or something. He's like, Dean, just stab it. <laughs> Yeah. So I stabbed it and we turned it around and then when I finally hit it, it was already broken on the other underside. <laughs> so conversely, if you've if you've made a lovely meal and does that just sit and go cold or do you have to keep it warm or depends where you are and kind of when it's going to get tested. You know, definitely desserts to get cold anyway. Because those remember those those kitchens are roasting hot. Yeah. Like well, when we were filming in June, July, it was like a sauna in there. It was horrible. You know, as soon as you walk in, red face, you're not even under pressure. It's just because it's so hot. Yeah. So, yeah, it just depends where you come in, you know, if you're being the first to get tested or the second or third. So, yeah. I noticed your face going red on a couple of the ones. Oh, you yeah. Want to that. <laughs> <laughs> when you're in the final then and the, the, the dishes are being judged and they're, they're talking about it, do you know at that stage you think I've got this or I don't have this or you, what are you thinking? Because there's a few times, I'll be honest, there's yeah. a couple of times even when you're getting feedback and you see you looking at them nodding and I'm not sure whether in your mind you're going, I don't believe this, you're talking rubbish or whether you're actually <laughs> going, no, no, that's a fair point there, Marcus. Yeah, I think I didn't really have any bad feedback from Marcus. One dessert I did, well, that was it. I listened to him and then all the other stuff, Marcus loved me. But you can tell when you're getting your 
you know, you're getting tech, like they're trying your dishes yeah. because you get to hear everyone else's. So you kind of judge your yeah. feedback compared to everyone else. And then you can kind of judge where, where you're going to come into that kind of, so you can, you can tell the, the, the final was, I, I, I got really good feedback on every dish. Yeah. Ollie overcooked his duck and uh, Lawrence uh, Marcus didn't like his starter. So we were all in this green room and it took like two, three hours till the final. We were all, we were all chatting away and they're like, oh, Dean, you've won this, you've won this, you know. So you I went into the room and the two other contenders like, you've won it, you know, <laughs> and we're just chatting away, you know, and then it's like Lawrence has won. I think it comes back to that journey thing, you know, Lawrence probably a better chef than me from his knowledge, from being in the Mission Star restaurant for so long and working for Sat Baines. The, st- the stuff this guy knows is incredible. It's for his age, unbelievable. He's going to be he's going to be one of the top chefs in the country. See, when he's 35, 40, everyone will know Lawrence's name, just because he's an incredible chef, you know? I think he was his favourite, to be honest. She had a little soft spot for him. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think the chefing world's a small world. You know, it's... Did she know him beforehand, do you think? Also about who you know, yeah, sometimes. You know, yeah, he, there and, we go. Me and JB thought there was something sticky going on there, mate. <laughs> no, well, he's, he's boss of Sat Baines. Sat, Sat Baines is a very well-known chef, you know, so, you know, it's, sometimes it can be about who you know and stuff like that. So these things definitely do help. It's just like in your normal working life as well. These things massively help. You know, if you're good pals with a couple of high-end Michelin star chefs, then, you know, you're going to do better than other people. Who was the most intimidating out of the three of them, or was it not like that? Out of Marcus, Monica, and Greg. Monica. <laughs> oh, you Monica. Monica. Yeah, yeah. I, I had I had Marcus under the wing. You know, I I'd have him purring like a cat every time I gave him food. That's you know? the one you want to cook for, isn't it? That's the guy. Definitely, but Monica, Monica was definitely. I think she could see see through some of my bullshit. <laughs> you know, <laughs> better than other people. You know, a lot of times you're winging it. Yeah, definitely she could see through that a bit more. So, yeah, Monica was definitely the person I was a bit more uh, scared of. But now, now you know, I've been still last week speaking to Monica. She's now bored with a company called Restaurant Box. I've been advising this company. So I've been helping build this company that she's now part of. So she was asking me for advice. How's this company? You know, you know much about it. I'm like, yeah, well, I've been on board since the start. So it's cool that now we're at the point where well, she came to ask me for advice last week, so that's nice. That's, that's pretty cool. Now, one of the things I think has benefited, if you like, from, from lockdown, because I'm not sure this would have happened without lockdown, is you're not the only one to be doing it, but your hard at home things and your collaborations, uh, yeah. I'm guessing that one is a, a lifeline to a business like yourself when you can't open, but yeah. two, how will that shape you in the future? Because... Do you have to open as often if hard at home is going as well as it's going? No, definitely. You need something tangible in business. I think the restaurants are the tangible kind of aspect of it. You know, hard at home is a food production unit in Perth. You know, customers don't know what it's going to look like. They can't see it. Whereas the restaurant is something we're always going to have to have and be open all the time. You know, I'm known for that. The restaurant is something that you know, I've always wanted and I always drive for. So, you know, don't get me wrong, the, the heart at home is definitely a business that would, is capable of carrying myself and my family. And I'd be comfortable just having that one business, but I'm not that person. You know, I want to have my restaurants. I want to have Har St. Andrews, Har Edinburgh. I want to have Harbour St. Andrews and Harbour everywhere. You know, so I'm always, you know, one thing's not enough for me. You grew up in Arbroath. Arbroath is known for fish and chips. Would we ever have a harbour in Arbroath? Um, potentially, yeah, but... You're being with peppers. <laughs> the thing is, you know, where you, you know what it's like when you when you grow up somewhere? For me, the best fish and chips in Arbroath is Golden Haddock, hands down, Claude. Ah, oh, Claude's amazing. You know what I mean? So and My wife's favourite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of people say it's Marcos, but Golden Haddock, hands down... Best thing to do in the world, grab a fish and chips, go and had it, walk down Danger Point, stand up on one of the little, you know, where you can walk up the stairs and you're in a little cage area, stand there eating your fish and chips, look at the North Sea. You know, seagulls try to attack you, but, you know, it's absolutely fantastic. Can of Iron Brew, 
it's like a Heston Blumenthal experience, isn't it? Putting the headphones on, just go down. Just yeah, point. exactly, yeah. I know you've got your signature dish of the lobster and things like that. Now, whether it be this or whether it be something else, but a bit like a pop star that has his, his big hit, I'll use Marty Pello, you know, when they had Love Is All Around, number one for 19 weeks, he actually grew to hate it, but he still had to sing it because that's what he wanted. Yeah. Do you have something that you keep on being requested to cook and you're all not hating it, but almost at that stage of this again? No, definitely not. No, you, no, you, not. Such a liar. <laughs> <laughs> Asian style, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, no. I, I think you know if I was there cooking it every day, then maybe. But I'm not the one always cooking it. You know, I'm there to do development and train the chefs to cook my dishes for me. Definitely in the restaurant, I'm there. One prob- probably helping prepare your lobster. I'm there. I'm the def- I am the one that finishes it for you, yeah. but. Yeah, definitely in our home and stuff. You know, we've got so many, a big team now that if, if I'm in there preparing lobster, something's wrong. You know, I, if I was in there preparing the lobster, then how are we going to run a business? You know, people won't have jobs. Before you made it big, for want of a better way of saying it, you, you trained in our growth as well. Now, I, th- I think you know this, but I know the woman that trained you. Um, and I asked her what your biggest disaster was when you were in training, what do you reckon she told me? Uh, I reckon Angela, <laughs> Angela's a great friend of mine. Um, I don't know, it would have been something from college. I try to think what, what disasters I had at college. Is there that many? Oh, there's a few. There's a few. <laughs> oh, of course, yeah, yeah, you're learning, you know. You, everyone had nicknames. So I remember one guy at college was called Fish Slice because he didn't know what Fish Slice was, you know. I've seen, remember at college, some guy got asked to clean the potatoes and there he is with dish soap in the sink cleaning the potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what's going to be. I hope it's not too embarrassing. To be fair, she was good as gold. She would not tell me. I was just hoping that we would get something out of you too. Um, so no, you're safe. Your secrets were safe with her. Oh, uh, by the way, we tried your linen gin as well. It's Did actually you? really nice. Oh, yeah. It's lush. It was so good. Very smooth. Was there a... Uh, and obviously it's called Lunon rather than Lunin. I, I can't be you're not allowed to call it Lunin, I'm guessing, but... Yeah, Lunin, spelled A-N, is a geographical place, and unless we're making the gin in Lunin, you can't call it that. Well, you can't... Tra- you could call it that, but you can't trademark it. So we changed the spelling so we could trademark it. But, yeah, so the, the kind of way we created that was running the restaurant. I was... I'm gin, gin, love gin. And at one point we had 30, 40 gins on the shelf. And none of them I love. Like, I'm like, oh, I like kind of like that one. I like something from that one. You know, this one's okay. The bottle's lovely here. But none of them was like, this is the one. This is the leading gin that I want to make as yeah. our kind of house gin. So con- old friend of mine from school, uh, Lewis Scholar, and contacted me. Dean, are you interested in making a gin? I'm, yes, actually, I am. <laughs> Straight away. So he's, we, we make the gin in our growth. You know, we used to go to school with Lewis. And he said, like, let's come come meet me. We'll have a we'll have a chat. So on the way to meet Lewis, stopped the Chinese supermarket, just went wild with all the spices, botanicals, seaweeds that I could find, everything I could imagine I wanted this gin to be. We just sat in this tasting room and over an afternoon, well, a day, we just put this gin together and started creating test batches for the gin and using elements from other gins. Like so I remember um Harris gin, super smooth because they use kelp in it, seaweed. It gets a little sweetness on your on your lip because of that. So for that reason, I want to use I want to use seaweed as well. I, I want to use kombu, Japanese seaweed, kelp family as well. And again, it leaves this lovely sweetness on your on your lip. And then the Szechuan, you know, is, is a lovely Chinese peppercorn. All my cooking contains ginger and garlic, basically, and chili. So ginger and garlic, uh, sorry, ginger and uh, ginger, what, what do I put in? Ginger and lemongrass, sorry. So these are great Asian botanics, put them in. Um, what else do we put in it? There's some orange in there, lime in there, kaffir lime leaves. So when you know when you open up a bottle, sure. you get that lovely um, floral kind of citrus. That's from that kaffir lime leaf. So it's absolutely beautiful stuff. So we created this from basically a, a, sh- a shopping day in a Chinese supermarket. And 
we, we wanted that no nonsense just taste so we wanted to find out so obviously you do a lot of testing and you, you learn a lot about the market when you do this and things that you'd never thought of happen happen you know so you think right your top 10 premium gins on your supermarket shelf they're premium of course they're premium 30 quid plus a bottle of the premium gins no they're not most of them are rubbish most of them to use a thing called folding process where they'll take like a 500 litre still they'll take all the botanics they'll put it in the still but instead of having a one batch recipe of the botanics they'll do 20 times as much botanics as they need in this dis distillation so you get basically a strong tea like leaving your tea bag and a cup of tea for really long it's really strong and then they dilute it so they have this 100 liters of really strong teed gin and then they dump it into raw grain spirit 20 times so it's called 20-fold process, or it could be a 15-fold process or a 10-fold process. So a lot of these premium gins use this process. So it's like a concentrate, basically. Yeah, it's a lot cheaper. But what it does is, you know, gin is not really known for drinking straight because it's too harsh. Yeah. That's the reason why it's too harsh, because most of the most of the spirit in it is not distilled. It's going through that distill again, sorry. So we we do a one-fold process, and that means everything that comes up the still is bottled. There's no diluting, adding to it, and that's why it's a lot smoother gin and a lot easier finishing. You get that sweetness, and the botanics are lovely and floral and stuff like that, because we, we're, not, we're not diluting. Oh, well, that's genius. That's really cool. Um, what If you were drinking it, what's, you know, how some people have put a cucumber in a gin or lime, or strawberries, etc. what would be the, the perfect accompaniment? Um, Chunk of agro smoggy? Yeah, exactly. Um, two, either two things. Uh, two things are slightly harder to get hold of, but a uh, lime leaf, kaffir lime leaf, you can get them from your local Chinese supermarket in the freezer section. You can get them in the supermarket in the dry section as well, but the frozen ones are the best ones. Okay. So garnishing the drink with one of them is, is probably the best. Or again, from your Chinese supermarket, some of the dried kombu seaweed comes in little sheets, cut them into little strips, or put that in your drink as well. So Either one of those two garnishes. What do you, a quick question, because I lived in Hong Kong, just back from Hong Kong after 20 odd years. What do you think of deepest, darkest Chinese cooking? Because I know Chinese meals here are not Chinese cooking. No, definitely not, no. So what do you think? Because I couldn't quite get to, after 20 years, I just couldn't get to grips with legit Chinese cooking. The palates are, it's just different. Yeah, I think it's, you have to, I, you have to remember as well, China is such a huge country that each region is massively different in style as well. Yeah, I think the Chinese supermarket is a great place to go to see. They, the, the Chinese supermarket, you will pick up the ingredients they are using. But, you know, a hot pot is probably the great, greatest example of Chinese cooking. Sichuan and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, total fragrant hot pot. I think that's one of their favourite dishes over there. You know, if it's a celebration thing, it's hot pot really, yeah. isn't it? Whereas you go to the Chinese in Arbroath, you're not going to get a hot pot, are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, chow mein and everything. <laughs> So looking ahead then for you, um, I, I know you mentioned, a, and it's been out there, that Har's probably going to move location once things are, are opened up again. Have you got a, a place in mind? Is it still going to be local in, in St Andrews? or? Yeah, definitely. We're, we're pushing for St Andrews. Um, currently, right now, at this moment, we, we've got a site, but... As you know, as in business, we have finer details have not been agreed yet ahead of terms. So, we, you know, we don't want to release any information until it's airtight, till we've got the lease. So, yes, definitely staying in St Andrews. Opening date, we're pushing for mid May, end of well, mid May to mid June, really, somewhere mm -hmm. around that kind of timeline. But at the same time, we're looking possibly the the aspect of opening another restaurant in Edinburgh at the same time. So we want wow. to open a restaurant in June in Edinburgh as well. And a Wagyu burger? Yeah, so Wa Wagyu burger, we want to basically, that's, you know, it's a concept created through lockdown. It's only an online company. You know, the, the volume we do is incredible. So, you know, we usually do about 2,000 burgers a week. So we want to now turn that into a tangible asset, really, somewhere that people can go and, and enjoy the burgers that we, we do, but, but in a restaurant setting, you know, more of, a, more of a bar, kind of funky, cool place. And we're launching our cocktail shaking as well, shaking with two A's. And so hopefully we're going to team those two companies up to create this bar restaurant. The cocktails, is that going to be a, a delivery type service as well that you can yeah. just 
Exactly, yes. Five cocktails delivered to your home. Got, hold on, bear with me a second. No, one, no one's seen this before, so you'll be the first. But this is shaken. All right, cool. Brilliant. It's a cocktail guide to the galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically you get, um, you can either order them individually, but you get your cosmopolitan, strawberry daiquiri, passion fruit martini, espresso martini, or a margarita. You know, obviously, your most common cocktails. That's delivered by the gallon, yeah? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, you can, especially for Christmas time, definitely. Well, hopefully for the summer as well. All these, uh, all these garden parties. I'm sure everyone's going to need a lot of cocktails. Yeah, right. there's going to be a lot of them because exactly. you just wonder if people will feel comfortable going back to a a, a pub. Yeah, just quickly. So I, I think that is going to be the way forward this summer potentially. Yeah, definitely. I think especially if they have restrictions on numbers still like that. You know. People are definitely going to be meeting their family in gardens and stuff that we're allowed to. We might give them a sample and, uh, and do another one. Yeah, why not? <laughs> right, we'll, we'll need to um, sort of wrap this up at some point. This has been great so far, but JB's got one last question. I mean, I could honestly talk to you all day about food stuff and things like that, but we've touched on all the, the, the fancier stuff in the fine dining. For anyone out there just looking for a normal sort of Scottish tea, what would be your perfect Stovey's recipe? Oh, you can annoy a lot of people with this. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, yeah. We're going to yeah. ask every chef that's on the show, so we're going to get a lot of different yeah. opinions. Look, look, I grew up with stovies with corned beef hash in it. There we go. Know, that, that's, that's the way I grew up. It was the cheapest way. Still, I love it. But if I was going to make it, braised, braised beef, you know, slow-cooked beef broken up into your mash. But nostalgia, corned beef. Corned beef, uh, yeah, definitely. I know you've got a lot of things on uh, today. So first of all, thank you so much for, for coming on. Once things are back to normal, we would love, if it's possible, to maybe come out and see the new site once it's up and running and maybe do something with you there. But we'll yeah, work with that yeah. a bit down the road. But uh, Dean, thank you so much. Thank you for the Charles Heidsick. It's lovely. Anybody listening, feel free to order that hair at home. It's a great morning aperitif. <laughs> it's great for hangovers, don't worry. <laughs> All the best for the future, <laughs> and we'll hopefully catch up with you soon. Fair, but thanks for having me. All right, no problem. Thanks, Cheers, well, Dean. Dean. Take care and all thanks. the best. Bye now. You've been listening to the Smokies and Wine podcast, sponsored by Clack and View Wealth Management, working with you today to plan for your tomorrow.